February 1959, nine students traversed the Ural Mountains, making camp on the slopes of Dead Mountain. That night, some dark presence descends, driving them to flee half-clothed into sub-zero temperatures. By morning, all are doomed to fates defying all reason. Sixty years later, the terrifying truth of those deaths remains buried beneath the ice. Welcome to the in-between. I'm Carol Ann, and this is the mysterious tale of the Dyatlov Pass Incident. Now, the Ural Mountains may not be the biggest or most famous range in Russia. That honor goes to the Caucasus in the south. But make no mistake, the Urals can be just as harsh and unforgiving, especially in wintertime. We're talking heavy snowfall, winds that cut right through you, and temperatures cold enough to freeze exposed skin solid in minutes. Not exactly your beginner's trek. Yet for some reason... That's exactly where our group of hikers wants to go. The group originally consists of eight men and two women. Most were students or graduates of Ural Polytechnical Institute or UPI. The goal of the 14-day expedition is to reach Mount Ortorton, a 3,900-foot or 1,200-meter-high mountain. The group is led by Igor Dyatlov, an experienced 23-year-old hiking and skiing enthusiast. The other nine are basically handpicked by Igor. This is not going to be an easy trip, so he wants to make sure that everyone on the team is qualified. The other nine teammates are Zina Kolmogorova, Ludmila Dubinina, Alexander Kolovatov, Rustam Slobodin, Nikolai Thibobrno, Semyon Zolotarov, Yuri Yudin, Yuri Duroshenko, and Yuri Kravonoshenko. All members are experienced in long ski tours and mountain expeditions, which is good because this route in this season is estimated as a Category 3 hike, the most difficult level. And let me just take a quick minute to say that I do not speak Russian, so my sincerest apologies if I mispronounce any names or places in this video. On January 23rd, 1959, the hour of departure finally arrives and our bold crew loads up their hefty packs, bids farewell to friends and family, and boards a train from Sverlovsk City, today Yekaterinburg, bound for Ivdel. They arrive at Ivdel on January 25th and then take a truck to Vijay, the last inhabited settlement so far north. They start their march to Mount Ortorton from Vijay on January 27th. The very next day, one of the members, Yuri Yudin, who had several health ailments, including rheumatism and a congenital heart defect, which really makes me wonder why he's included in the team in the first place. But I guess he was fine most of the time and only had occasional rheumatism flare-ups and has done these crazy winter expeditions before. But he decides that the pain in his knees and joints is just too much. And he makes the difficult decision to abandon the expedition and remain behind in Vijay while his comrades press onwards. Now, it had been agreed beforehand that Igor would send a telegram to their sports club back at UPI as soon as the group returned to Vijay. They expected that would be no later than February 12th. But Dyatlov tells Yuri, hey, don't be surprised if it takes us a little longer. Hugs and farewells are exchanged, and on January 28th, the group continues on while Yuri turns back toward Vijay to wait for his friend's return. Over the next few days, the group of nine treks deep into the frozen northern Urals, relying on their compass and maps to navigate the snowy wilderness. The physical exertion is intense, requiring frequent rest breaks. Each night, they huddle in their one huge tent, their only refuge from the whipping wind and frigid air. During the day, the endless pines and unbroken snow tests their stamina and resolve. Igor leads the way through the deep snow as best he can. February 1st, they get kind of a late start and only make it about two and a half miles or four kilometers that day. They stop around 5 p.m. and set up camp on a slope of Mount Kolatsiakl, just 
10 miles or 16 kilometers from Mount Otorton. Kalatsiakal translates to Dead Mountain in the language of the indigenous Mansi people. How creepy and foreshadowing is that? They stow away some of their extra provisions for their return trip and settle down to dinner about six or seven o'clock. Then something goes catastrophically wrong. February 12th comes and goes. Nothing, not a peep. And at first people think, well, maybe the weather delayed them a few days or maybe they changed up their route a bit at the last minute. Remember, Igor told Yuri before they parted that even he thought that they wouldn't make it back by the 12th. February 20th comes without any word from the hikers. Their families start to plead with the authorities at this point to send out search teams, convinced something has gone terribly wrong out there. So the first rescue groups consisting of volunteer students and teachers are sent out on the 20th. By the 26th, with still no word from anybody, the army and police forces become involved, with planes and helicopters being ordered to join the rescue operation. After days spent slogging through sub-zero temperatures and endless snow, finally, a discovery. In a clearing at the base of the mountain, the searchers spot something, a shock of color against the icy wasteland. It's the group's tent, still pitched. But as rescuers rush closer, the scene only deepens the dread. The tent's been ripped open from the inside, with no sign of the Nine outside or anywhere nearby. It appears as if the team had hastily fled, wearing almost no gear or protection from the bitter elements. Searchers are baffled by the chaotic scene of disorder and the reckless, illogical escape from the tent, abandoning their stove, shoes, and everything else. A chain of eight or nine sets of footprints wearing only socks or a single shoe or even barefoot can be seen that lead down towards the edge of the woods almost a mile away or one and a half kilometers. But at that point, they covered with snow. Keep in mind that at the time the hikers are thought to flee their tent, the temperature is just below zero or 20 below Celsius, and that's not factoring in any wind. Once the icy wind touched their skin, delirium would have set in within minutes. At the forest edge under a large old cedar, the search party finds the remains of a fire along with the first two bodies, those of Yuri Krivoshenko and Yuri Doroshenko, lying side by side, shoeless and dressed only in their underwear. On February 27th, between the cedar and the tent, the searchers find Igor Dyatlov and Zina Kolmogorova. And six days later, on March 5th, Rustam Slobodin. The three seem to have died in poses and locations suggesting that they were attempting to return to the tent. Five comrades are now accounted for. A medical examination found no injuries, which might have led to their deaths, so it was concluded that they had died of hypothermia. But four are still missing somewhere out in that icy abyss. Could any of the remaining four still be clinging to life out there? Maybe they escaped together before the brutal elements could take them. Searchers cling to this last feeble hope as they continue combing the endless pines and ravines. But they find nothing. No sign of the other four hikers. In the days following the abandoned tent's discovery, the search party perseveres in combing the area of Kalatsiakal for survivors or remains. Spotter planes scan the endless forests and ravines to no avail as rescuers on foot systematically widen their search area. On May 5th, they make a ghastly find. The final four bodies. They're found under 12 feet or four meters of snow in a ravine 150 feet or 50 meters farther into the woods from the cedar tree. These four are better dressed than the others and clearly had the presence of mind to know that they were in trouble and did everything they could to preserve themselves because they're wearing clothes that belong to some of the others who were apparently already dead. 
but they managed to dig out a den in the snow and line it with branches in an effort to keep themselves warm. And some of the clothes taken from the bodies underneath the cedar tree were placed on the cedar branches. So they knew they were in trouble, but they were certainly working the problem. But the examination of these four bodies changes everything. Alexander did die of hypothermia, but his eyebrows are missing and his body has turned a grayish, greenish purple color. But the other three did not. Their bodies tell a completely different story, a story we are still trying to figure out to this day. These three all have fatal injuries. Nikolai's skull is totally shattered and both Ludmila and Semyon's ribs are smashed laterally. So not like a blow to the front or the back, but more like they were squeezed from the sides. According to one of the forensic experts, the force required to cause this kind of damage would have been extremely high, like a car crash. But none of the bodies have any external wounds. It's like they were hit with some kind of massive pressure wave. Ludmila is missing her eyes and her tongue and has 10 broken ribs, four of them in two places. Semyon's eyes are gone too, and he has five broken ribs, all of them in two places. Nikolai's skull is smashed with such force that an attack from another human is ruled out because humans can't hit that hard. Yet not even a bruise or a cut on his scalp. It defies logic. No animal attacks like this or scavenges like this. And there's no external wounds. Outside of Alexander's missing eyebrows, it's like some powerful outside force systematically destroyed them from the inside out. Even stranger, the four are neatly buried side by side under the snow, almost as if deliberately arranged. The government totally fails to identify any rational cause for the horrific mutilations. The families beg for answers, but all the medical experts and investigators keep coming back empty handed. Whatever did this left no measurable traces besides the devastated bodies. And there are so many more anomalies that I haven't even touched on. Messed up DNA, connections to the KGB, radioactive clothing, missing axes and knives, eyewitness testimony that says that he saw the first two bodies covered over with a blanket, obviously post-mortem, and that the KGB staged the scene. Testimony that government officials were quietly taking an overly active interest in the case, while at the same time pressuring investigators to shut it down. If you are interested in a deep dive on this, I highly recommend visiting dyatlovpass.com. I will put a link to it in the list of sources in the description below. Oh my God, it is a wealth of information. So many details and whatnot, I couldn't even begin to dig into it all. But let me know if you would like me to do a deeper dive video in the future. So with the whole country watching, the Soviet authorities are under massive pressure to explain what happened, but they have zero answers. Finally, after months of fumbling around, they throw up their hands and declare, it is concluded that the cause of their demise was overwhelming force, which the hikers were not able to overcome. Nice non-answer. The families scream cover up, demanding more evidence, but the government sticks firmly to the natural phenomenon line and seals off the area. Records get locked down. Physical evidence is declared totally off limits. The Kremlin absolutely shuts down any deeper digging into this thing until 2019. In 2019, Russian authorities suddenly reopen the investigation, saying they'll utilize modern science to crack the case once and for all, reigniting sparks of hope that maybe now we'll get some real answers. The bodies get exhumed for new autopsies and testing, DNA analysis to confirm identities, which it kind of does, scans check radiation levels, again, nothing anomalous, but the core questions surrounding the shocking injuries all the examiners 
ultimately shake their heads, saying the original autopsy data still stands. After all the hype, the 2019-2020 inquest just kind of fizzles out and peters away inconclusively. No single theory fully explains all these freaky facts. So short of a bombshell confession, this is as close as we may ever get to what actually happened on that lonely pass. In honor of the nine doomed hikers, the site of the incident is formally named Dyatlov Pass in the early 1960s. A memorial plaque is later erected at the pass to commemorate the fateful events and pay tribute to the victims. And Yuri Yudin, the hiker who stays behind, lives with the mystery of what happened to his comrades for over 50 years until his death in 2013 at the age of 75. His name is then added to the memorial of his fallen friends. Now, of course, there are tons of theories as to what happened. Who can resist that? So let's take a look at the list, starting with the easiest ones. Avalanche. A slide crushing the tent causes the team to panic and rush out into the frigid night unprepared. Well, the tent wasn't buried in snow, and there's no evidence of a large debris field that would come from an avalanche. Also, there has never been an avalanche recorded on that slope. Animal attacks. There are no external wounds, prints, or typical attack patterns evident. I'm sure some of the post-mortem injuries are likely caused by scavengers, but not the major injuries. And the Monsi people called that mountain Death Mountain because there are no animals up there. Attack by tribespeople theory. Some have theorized that local tribal groups like the Mansi might have ambushed the hikers, seeing their presence on the peaks as disrespectful. But the Mansi generally avoided contact with outsiders rather than attacking them. And there are several footprints in the snow showing a calm and orderly evacuation of the tent, not a frenzied defense from attacking forces. Plus, you'd think a human ambush would leave more obvious traumatic wounds instead of the creepy bloodless precision stuff we see here. With no history of violence against strangers and no tangible indications of a tribal attack, it's pretty unlikely that the Mansi went on some random rampage. Secret weapons testing theory. Some theorists think that the Soviet military could have been running secret operations in the remote Urals that went haywire and killed the hikers. Maybe testing some experimental ray gun or sound weapon that accidentally amplified to lethal levels could explain the freakish internal damage at least, but no records show the USSR conducting any classified tests in that area back then. And while there is radiation detected on a few articles of clothing, the radiation levels on the bodies checks out normal too, ruling out exposure from a nuclear mishap. You'd think if the government was responsible, they'd cover it up by any means necessary, not do a sloppy investigation leaving weird clues. While it's possible that the KGB still hides details, nothing directly points to a deadly military accident in the mountains that night. Catabatic winds theory. Some researchers propose fierce catabatic winds, which are winds of high density air that get pulled down the side of a mountain due to gravity, that these winds may have swooped down the slope that night, frightening the group into fleeing their tents. These powerful gusts can reach hurricane speeds and could have damaged the tent and whipped up a frenzy. Additionally, infrasound waves at frequencies below human hearing can induce panic and hallucinations. The alleged windstorm may have generated these disturbing subaudible vibrations. Together, the deafening wind and disorienting infrasound could have sparked irrational terror, luring the hikers out improperly dressed until they succumbed to hypothermia. However, some point out that winds typically leave visible damage, which was missing at the campsite, and infrasound alone cannot account for the catastrophic injuries found in some of the hikers. 
could both catabatic gusts and infrasound have contributed to the confusion and poor decisions that doomed the group that night? Sure, but those forces certainly don't cover every base. Yeti attack theory. Now, given the remote location, I'd be remiss not to address the legends of the Yeti possibly lurking in those mountains. Some have proposed it was one of these elusive creatures that savaged the hikers. And it is true that sightings have persisted in the area over the years, enough that we can't completely rule out some giant primate roaming the Ural snows. Many believers have pointed to this photograph as evidence of the creature in the area. I, for one, believe this photo is just a blurry image of one of the hikers dressed for the cold. But if the rumors of such a creature are true, it certainly would have the horrendous force necessary to inflict the rib and skull fractures seen on some of the bodies. But just like the animal attack theory, where are the signs of a struggle? UFO encounter theory. There are documented reports of orange orbs floating in the sky in a town just 50 miles from where the hikers were. And some injuries, like Ludmila missing her eyes and her tongue, sure are reminiscent of injuries incurred in animal mutilation cases reported around the world. But what would make them leave their tent? If they're in the tent, they wouldn't see any UFOs or even orange orbs floating around in the sky. Something would have had to come to them and make them leave the tent. But again, no other footprints of any kind are found anywhere in the area. Psychic or paranormal phenomena. There has been some speculation that some kind of psychic paranormal force was responsible. Like maybe a malevolent spirit or vortex of dark energy descended on the campsite, triggering irrational panic and luring them to their gruesome fates. At this point, I guess anything is possible. It would explain why they fled so frantically without a clear threat and the lack of measurable physical evidence at the scene. But without hard scientific proof or any evidence of any kind, this one's just wild speculation. Now here we come to the latest and greatest theory that might just be the best candidate of them all. The slab avalanche theory. Alexander Puzrin of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, who has studied slab avalanches, and Johann Gaum of the Snow Avalanche Simulation Laboratory at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, used computer models to recreate the event. By using the animation code from the movie Frozen, they modeled the movement of the snow given the conditions present on the mountain that night. First, the hikers cut into the snow to level an area for the tent, and the resulting vertical wall helps to shield the tent from the wind. Common practice at that time. But according to this theory, the hikers do not realize that under the top layer of snow is a layer of sugary snow that can move with much less friction than other types of snow. Then the catabatic winds come into play. The winds are coming down the side of the mountain and likely bringing all of the snow from the top of the mountain down to the bottom and depositing at least some of it right above the tent, increasing the weight on that top layer of snow. At some critical mass point, the weight of the top layer gets to be too much and the sugar snow gives way, sending that top layer off the edge and onto the tent. And since it's only the top layer of snow that comes down, you don't see the large debris field associated with a normal avalanche. Crash test data from General Motors is then used to simulate an avalanche's impact on humans. The researchers show that a block of snow no bigger than an SUV can cause the resulting injuries when it rams into the tent. The victims with chest and head injuries survive for a time before succumbing to their wounds, which coincides with what the computer models revealed. Pretty good theory. It's definitely plausible and covers a lot of the bases, but I'm still not convinced. Rib fractures? Sure. 
they're probably sleeping on their sides. Nikolai's skull fractures? That I don't know about. The skull fracture pattern looks like more of a localized hit than the wider spread pressure of heavy snow. But okay, let's go with that. Then it stands to reason that once the snow hits, they cut themselves out of the tent with the uninjured ones carrying the injured. But if they're all lined up in the same tent, why don't they all suffer from these catastrophic injuries? And not all experts agree that there were catabatic winds on the mountain that night. I don't know. It certainly comes the closest, but I don't think it covers everything. So, 60 years later, what do we make of this whole mess? Well, here's the frustrating truth. No single explanation, normal or paranormal, perfectly fits all the crazy facts. Even with new theories, the story endures over the decades as one of Russia's most iconic unsolved mysteries. That perfect mix of creepy discoveries, macabre clues, and utter bafflement at the end. I mean, just look at the cultural ripples, books, movies, podcasts, and more, dissecting the puzzle from every angle. Tourists and amateur web sleuths flock to the past trying to find something, anything, the tiniest unfound clue that could bring light to this craziness. True crime junkies and paranormal enthusiasts can't get enough. It's totally part of the modern folklore now. 60 years later, the mystery of the Dyatlov Pass incident draws us still with the memorials that beg the living never to forget the dead. In the end, what lingers most across the decades are the faces of those nine shining youths full of spirit snuffed out too soon. The secrets of Dyatlov Pass may never be unearthed from that snow-covered mountain, but our quest for understanding the strange and unexplained never ends. The world of the unknown has even more to offer because the next thrilling mystery is just the tiniest click away in this special video right here chosen just for you. Why risk regret by passing it up? Go on, click it. And as always, be careful out there. And I will see you here again on The In-Between. <laughs>